So there's this word, a kind of technical word, that has been at the center of the explosive public debate over NSA spying, precipitated by the Edward Snowden revelations. And right around when the first news leaked of bulk call record collection, Kieran Healy, a political scientist, very cleverly showed just how powerful this sort of abstract-sounding word really was. Using a few lists of different organizations and their membership at the time of the revolution, the American Revolution, Healy was able to produce a fairly simple map of social relations that showed that a fella by the name of Paul Revere was more or less the most influential rabble-rouser in all of Massachusetts and likely to be up to something not quite kosher from the English Crown's perspective. Now, for months, the President and his allies have argued against, again and again, that metadata, which is the word that we use to describe this kind of data, that metadata collection isn't much of a privacy threat because the NSA isn't listening in on your calls. They're just looking into who you talk to and how long your calls are and what's the harm in that anyway. When it comes to telephone calls, nobody is listening to your telephone calls. What uh, the intelligence community is doing is looking at phone numbers and durations of calls. They are not looking at people's names, and they're not looking at content. But by sifting through this so-called metadata, they may identify potential leads with respect to folks who might engage in terrorism. Well, today's news brings us a blockbuster story from the newly launched website The Intercept that shows just how powerful metadata really is. The NSA is using metadata as, quote, the primary method to locate targets for lethal drone strikes. In other words, metadata is being used right now by the United States government to target people for killing. As in, don't worry, they're not listening to your phone calls, they're just running an algorithm to determine whether they're going to blow someone up. Quote, in one tactic, the NSA geolocates the SIM card, or handset, of a suspected terrorist mobile phone, enabling the CIA and U.S. military to conduct night raids and drone strikes to kill or capture the individual in possession of the device. Which means that we, as a country, are right now targeting and killing individuals without knowing for sure who the person we are killing is because we are literally targeting SIM cards and blowing up whoever's attached to them. Joining me now, Jeremy Scahill. He just started up a new digital magazine called The Intercept. He's also writer and producer of the film Dirty Wars, which has been nominated for an Academy Award based on his book by the same name. All right, Jeremy, so I, I think I understand that basically what, what you're saying in the reporting that you have in The Intercept today is we are actually targeting SIM cards. The thing that we are targeting, the thing that we're going after and sending a drone strike at is a, is, is a cell phone, essentially, and a chip inside a cell phone, as opposed to this individual who's 27 and we know trained here and there. Right. We have a, a new source, Chris, who worked with the NSA and actually was a drone operator for the elite Joint Special Operations Command, JSEC, of the U.S. military. And he said, you know, people get hung up on this idea that we have a kill list, but actually it's not a kill list. It's a list of either SIM cards or uh, um, numbers that are associated with handsets. And so when the U.S. military or the CIA are targeting individuals, they don't necessarily know the identity. They just know that they're targeting that phone or that SIM card. And it's a system rife with errors. And, you know, just to, to emphasize the point you're making, which is a good one about metadata, uh, you can have a, a, a scenario where these, the, there's these so-called signature strikes where the U.S. doesn't actually know the identity of a person they're intending to kill. They just know that their phone has been in a certain location, right. has called other phones on the watch list, or has been you know, in a mosque or at a particular restaurant. So it's, it's, it's rife with errors so, and opens the door for, I think, a lot of the civilian deaths we've seen. Yeah, that, that I think there's a, there's a whole variety of issues whenever we talk about the, the, the targeted killing program in terms of moral ones and constitutional ones and legal ones and efficacy, but let's just narrow in on this narrow question, which I think is, I think everyone, there's a consensus that no one wants to see a completely random waiter at a restaurant blown up by a warhead that we sent because he happened to end up with a SIM card that was calling the wrong people. And that is the question here, right? If we don't know who the actual person is, it does seem like there is a, quite a lot of open space for error there. Exactly. I mean, we're sort of in this era, this era already of pre-crime, where you have President Obama in office. His advisors know that if there's another major attack on the U.S. homeland, that he's political toast. And so what they've sort of done is go way overboard in trying to preempt 
any potential attack against the United States. And what they've done is instead of sending actual U.S. operatives on the ground, which would constitute human or human intelligence, they're relying 90 percent or more on what's called SIGINT or IMINT, signals intelligence or imagery intelligence. And so what we have are strikes being authorized on the idea that we believe that this phone or this SIM card is associated with someone who right. is up to no good. And if you think about it in the context, this could come back at home very, very quickly, not necessarily in a militarized drone strike. The president says he's against that, but in using it to target individuals in the United States based on our cell phone. What if you lend your cell phone uh, to someone else uh, and you happen to be in Yemen? You send your kid to the grocery store uh, to pick up something, and that's the moment the CIA decides to strike. Right. I mean, this, this is a system, and we've heard from insiders, Chris, who have been a part of this and defend the program to the extent that it has taken out people, but they say, look, the potential for errors means that we should put a pause button on it, step back, and look at how this is essentially death by metadata. This, th there is a, another report in the AP today, four anonymous officials basically saying the U.S. is currently contemplating a, a targeted killing action against an American citizen. This story was strange to me for a number of reasons. One, why are they talking now? Two, what is the purpose? And three, it seemed to, to kind of bury the lead, which is that we've already done this. I'm not quite clear what would be new here. How did you react to that story? Right. I mean, as you know, because you've talked about this probably more than almost anyone on corporate television, you know, President Obama has admitted that the U.S. has killed uh, four U.S. citizens in a drone strike, uh, the most prominent, Anwar al awlaki this American citizen. Uh, to, to me, Chris, politically, this indicates that the White House has already made a decision that they're going to kill another American citizen, and they're sort of floating a balloon out to the American public. This raises very, very serious issues uh, about the constitutionality of the drone strike program, whether or not uh, the U.S. believes it can kill its own citizens without even charging them with a crime, where the president has sort of emperor-like powers, should be something that our courts should take up very, very quickly, and that should be the subject of much debate in Congress, and not just from the Rand Pauls and the Justin Amashes of the world. Right. It should be something the Democrats should actually pay attention to. Jeremy Scahill from the new site, The Intercept, his film, Dirty Wars. Good luck at the Academy Awards, Jeremy. Thanks, Chris. All right, coming up, the player who could be the first openly gay man in the NFL. His agent will be here ahead.